Well, good morning. Good to see you all here. Uh, You can open your Bibles and join me in the book of Hebrews, and we'll be in chapters 8 and 9 this morning. Let's pray together before we begin. Our Father, we thank You for Your Word, and we thank You that it is powerful by Your Holy Spirit, and that we can engage in this next period of time together with great expectation that You uh, can do and will do the things that only You do. So we pray that You'd help us understand Your Word, and most of all, help. would You open the eyes of our hearts so that we can behold Your glory in Jesus, that we can be transformed, become more like Him, and that we would be receiving great comfort from Your Word. We pray also for other churches um, around this area that are opening Your Word right now, and we pray that You would work powerfully in them as well um, with these other gatherings of our brothers and sisters so that all around this area we would hear You speak and be conformed to the image of Jesus. pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we are looking at the book of Hebrews for Advent. And the last two Sundays, we've seen how Jesus fulfills two central themes in the Old Testament, the theme of priest and the theme of covenant. So Jesus came as the true and better priest, and He brought the new and better covenant. And this morning, we're going to look at Hebrews 8 and 9 to see how He fulfills the theme of the tabernacle. So the tabernacle was this tent that the Lord had Israel set up in their Midst, and it was made for God's presence. It was later replaced by the temple. Now, what does the tabernacle have to do with Advent and Christmas? Well, what is Advent about? It's about how God came to us. So, one of the names that Jesus was called was Emmanuel, right, which means God with us. So, at Advent, we remember that in the birth of Jesus, we have Jesus as both truly God and truly human. The eternal Son of God, God the Son, came to us in human flesh. He drew near to us, and He did it for a purpose, and the purpose was so that we would draw near to Him. So, this is what we want to remember at Advent. There's a lot going on in your lives right now, uh, at least most of you, and this whole month is filled with a lot, and we often know that even in the midst of all the busyness, We recognize that the most important thing around times of busyness like this is our relationships. The best part is being with those that we love. But even in that, even the relational love that we experience, that itself is a pointer to something greater. It's about being restored to God and in relationship with Him. So Jesus came at Advent to restore us to God. And so that's what the tabernacle is all about. The tabernacle is about the presence of God, and it was given to create a longing among God's people for Jesus. The tabernacle was given to create a longing for the presence of God and the restoration Jesus would bring, and that's what Jesus came to do at Advent. So the tabernacle is all about God drawing near to His people so that they would draw near to Him. And that theme is fulfilled in Jesus at Advent and Christmas. So, we're looking at Hebrews chapter 8, and what we'll do is we'll look at the first five verses of chapter 8, and then we'll skip ahead to chapter 9 and the first 10 verses there, because last week we looked at the central section here, the second half of chapter 8, about the new covenant that Jesus brought. But on both sides of that text we looked at last week is this theme of tabernacle um, and Jesus being uh, entering into the true tabernacle. So, let's read this together. Now, the point in what we are saying is this, this is Hebrews 8.1, we have such a high priest, one who is seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heaven, a minister in the holy places, in the true tent that the Lord set up, not man. For every high priest is appointed to offer gifts and sacrifices, thus it is necessary for this priest, Jesus, also to have something to offer. Now, if he were here on earth, he would not be a priest at all, since there are priests who offer gifts according to the law. They serve a copy and shadow of the heavenly things. For when Moses was about to erect the tent, he was instructed by God, saying, See that you make everything according to the pattern that was shown you on the mountain. And now let's jump ahead to chapter 9. Now, even the first covenant had regulations for worship in an earthly place of holiness, for a tent was prepared, the first section, 
in which were the lampstand and the table and the bread of presence. It is called the holy place. Behind the second curtain, a second section called the most holy place, having the golden altar of incense and the ark of the covenant covered on all sides with gold, in which was a golden urn holding the manna and Aaron's staff that budded and the tables or tablets of the covenant. Above it were the cherubim of glory overshadowing the mercy seat. Of these things we cannot now speak in detail. These preparations having thus been made, the priests go regularly into the first section, performing their ritual duties. But into the second, only the high priest goes, and he but once a year, and not without taking blood, which he offers for himself and for the unintentional sins of the people. By this, the Holy Spirit indicates that the way into the holy places is not yet opened, as long as the first section is still standing, which is symbolic for the present age. According to this arrangement, gifts and sacrifices are offered that cannot perfect the conscience of the worshiper, but deal only with food and drink and various washings, regulations for the body imposed until the time of reformation. Well, here's the message of this text for us this morning. Jesus drew near to us at Advent so that we could draw near to Him forever. So that's the message of the text. The two main ideas this morning that we'll see here, first, the story of the tabernacle, and then second, the significance of the tabernacle, and then we'll consider what this means for us in light of this being Advent and Christmas. Okay, so first, the story of the tabernacle. This is the beginning of chapter 8. So the tabernacle was this tent that God had Israel set up at Sinai in the wilderness. And so as they traveled, they pitched it in the middle of their camp. And they brought their sacrifices there, and the priests served there. And so this little tent is part of a much bigger story from Genesis to Revelation. And this is why it's connected to Advent and to Jesus. So this is what the author of Hebrews is showing us from the first five verses of chapter 8. He's making the case that Jesus completes the Old Testament story of the tabernacle. Jesus brings all of the themes, all of the promises of the Old Testament to a fulfillment, and that includes the tabernacle. So let's see how. So in verse 1, he summarizes the bigger point he's been making. So he says, now the point in what, in what we're saying is this. We have such a high priest, one who is seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heaven. So that's really what Taylor had focused on a couple weeks ago. This is summarizing the point from the previous chapters. Jesus is the greatest priest we could ever have. He's the only priest we could ever need. So Jesus is the eternal and divine Son of God. He came as a human being at Advent. He lived a perfect life. He died on the cross for us. He rose again, and He ascended to heaven. And now, He is there in the Father's presence. But look at how verse 2 describes the location where Jesus is now. He is a minister in the holy places, in the true tent that the Lord set up, not man. So he says that Jesus Christ, risen, ascended, exalted, and reigning, has a ministry in the holy places. And all through the Old Testament, that was a way of referring to the tabernacle and the temple, the holy places. But the author is saying Jesus did not enter into a tabernacle or temple on earth. He entered into a tabernacle in heaven. And look at how he refers to the tabernacle. He calls it the true tent that the Lord set up, not man. So the tabernacle was a tent that the Lord had Moses set up. Now Jesus entered into the true tent. Now we often think the opposite of true is false. Uh, true enough. But true also refers to something often like the authentic or the genuine one. So it's one of the real and lasting valuable things. So, to say it's the true tent, it means that this tent is the real tent, the one of lasting value, the, signific the one that has most significance. So, what's the difference then between Israel's tent and the true tent? Well, verse 5 gives the contrast. They, the priests, serve a copy. Look at this language, a copy 
and a shadow of the heavenly things. For when Moses was about to erect the tent, he was instructed by God saying, see that you make everything according to the pattern that was shown to you on the mountain. So those words, copy, shadow, pattern. So what's a copy? Well, you have an original picture that you're looking at, and then you scan a copy of it, or you draw a copy of it. It's not the original, but it's a copy. And a shadow, right? A shadow is cast from from something more substantial, right? So the substance is there, and a shadow just gives a general shape of it. And a pattern, pattern is not the real thing. It just gives the general shape as well. So that's what the tabernacle was. It was a copy or a shadow or a replication of a pattern. So God showed Moses a pattern that he was to copy. And that happened when Moses was on Mount Sinai. God instructed him to build a tabernacle. And he said, make sure you make it exactly how I'm showing you in all the detail. And so God showed him a pattern that he was to copy. This is Exodus 25, verse 9. That's what the author of Hebrews is quoting here. God said to Moses, exactly as I show you concerning the pattern of the tabernacle and all its furniture, so you shall make it. Now, it's hard to know exactly what Moses was seeing. Um, He saw some kind of copy or model of the heavenly dwelling of God, and he was to replicate that model that he got a vision of. So this means that the earthly tabernacle is a copy of God's heavenly dwelling. It's not God's true dwelling. It's more like a shadow. So here's the big idea. We see from the Old Testament itself that something greater was coming. The tabernacle was never intended to be the ultimate goal, and Moses and the Israelites were to have received that message. They would have recognized this is not it. This is a copy of something better of something greater. It was always meant to be temporary and symbol-laden. And the greater reality is God's heavenly dwelling that the risen Christ has now entered. The author says this similar kind of thing a number of way, different ways in the next couple chapters. So look ahead with me to Hebrews chapter 9. Look at verses 11. But when Christ appeared as a high priest of the good things that have come, then through the greater and more perfect tent, not made with hands, that is not of this creation, he entered once for all into the holy places. So the earthly tent was made with human hands. God's heavenly dwelling place is in heaven, and it's a greater and more perfect tent. And then in verses 23 to 24, thus it was necessary for the copies of the heavenly things to be purified with these rites, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. For Christ has entered not into holy places made with hands, which are copies of the true things, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God on our behalf. So the tabernacle system consists of copies of the true and heavenly things. And then finally, chapter 10, verse 1 The law has but a shadow of the good things to come instead of the true form of these realities. So the law gave the tabernacle, which was a shadow. And what was it a shadow of? The good things to come in the future, which have now come in Jesus. Now we can read this today and think, okay, why is this so important? Well, first, think about why this was so important for the first generation of Christians, those who were receiving this, this first and second generation. Many of them had a Jewish background. They valued the tabernacle and then later the temple, which was more of a stable structure of the tabernacle. And this was at the very heart of their faith, the place where God would dwell on earth the center of their life of faith, the center of their economy and political uh, world as well. But they're seeing now that it was the center of the reality, but now that Jesus has come, they have to adjust. They have to see that this was just temporary. It was all pointing forward 
to something better in Jesus. But this is hard for them to embrace. So many of these Christians were tempted to leave Jesus and go back to Judaism, to something they could see, to something that God had instituted that was good, that many of their family and friends probably still embrace and have rejected Jesus and actually think that Jesus was blasphemous for saying that those things really don't matter anymore. They're being surpassed. And the author is saying, you can't go back. You miss the whole point if you leave Jesus and go back to the copies. When we were adopting our son, Moses, we got a few pictures of him. And he was probably about two weeks old. And we loved those pictures. We treasured those pictures. We showed everyone those pictures. This is our son. We're about to adopt this boy. And we stared at those pictures. We framed the pictures. We kept the pictures around. And then we visited him. Now, the picture was just a representation of him. It wasn't actually him, of course. It was good, and we're grateful for it. We loved it, but it was just a copy of the reality. So, when we actually were with Moses, we didn't kind of have a time. We're like, okay, now put him in the crib so we can go check out that picture again. We usually do this at night before bed, right? Let's cuddle up with this picture. No, that would be ridiculous. It was pointing to a greater reality. And now that our son had come, we don't need the picture. It was a pointer. So that's the story of the tabernacle. It was a copy of the heavenly reality and future reality to come in Jesus. So why does this matter? Let's keep asking that question. So second then, the significance of the tabernacle. We see why this matters by contrasting it with Jesus' ministry. Like, why, why the tabernacle matters by contrasting it with Jesus' ministry in the true tabernacle. So, this is what the author does at the beginning of chapter 9 now. He shows how the physical structure of the tabernacle was itself symbolic. It was communicating. It had clear limitations, and those limitations were revealing something about something greater that would arrive. So, the emphasis here is actually kind of surprising. It's on the physical structure of the tabernacle. The author here focuses on how the tent had two parts. The first section, after the courtyard, the first section of the tent was what we call the holy place. And then the second section is the most holy place. So when you enter in the tabernacle, you go into the first room, and that's the holy place. And then you would, from there, enter into the most holy place. So he first focuses on this first section. He calls this the first tent. It's the first room of the tabernacle. Look at verse 2. For a tent was prepared, the first section, in which were the lampstand and the table and the bread of presence. It's called the holy place. And then the second room is discussed in the next few verses. He says the second room is the most holy place, and there's the Ark of the Covenant in there and some of the items inside of the Ark. But we're not going to focus on all those details there because the author isn't. Look at the end of verse 5. Of these things, we cannot now speak in detail. Though many people, if you Google, have spoken in great detail of those things. Um, He's giving all of this to make the point that there are two different rooms. And then he focuses on what happens inside each room. They're both very different. The first room has a lot going on. Priests go inside all the time. The second room... He draws attention to the fact that it's quiet. No one goes in. Just the high priest, one time every year on the Day of Atonement. So that's what he's emphasizing in verses 6 and 7. You look at the first room, hop in place. You look at the second room, quiet. Just one entrance once a year. So what's the point of that? Why is he drawing attention to the structure of it? Well, the key idea is limitation. He's showing how this whole setup was limited. It wasn't ideal. So then he's going to contrast that limited structure with the new setup with Jesus. So we see three contrasts now in verses 8 through 10. So here's three things that Jesus has come to open up for us. These are three things that help us understand the meaning of Advent, why Jesus came. They're three amazing gifts that Jesus gives us if we'll have them. And this is really... The point of this sermon. So here's the three 
greater realities Jesus brings. First is access to God. So he, his point in giving all the details about the tabernacle is to say that the way into God's presence was not yet open. This is verse 8. By this, the Holy Spirit indicates that the way into the holy places is not yet opened as long as the first section still standing, which is symbolic for the present age. So the tabernacle, he's saying, is communicating a message. The Holy Spirit was communicating through this. And the Holy Spirit had a message, and the message was this. The way to God's presence is not yet open. Yes, you can pray to Him, but there is a real sense in which you are not able to enter the presence of God. In the beginning in Eden, heaven and earth were joined together. God's presence was with His people. Ever since sin entered, they're separated. And now you have this little tabernacle with God's presence, but God's presence in a room that no one can get in except one person once a year. So he's drawing attention to that there's real limitation to our ability to dwell in God's presence. You can only come so close. So really the tabernacle had this tension built into it. At one level, it was saying, God is here. God is with you. Another level, it said, stay back. You can't come in. Only the high priest, no one else. And the author of Hebrews draws attention to something fascinating here. He says that the two sections… As I understand this, uh, the two sections represent two eras in, we could call it redemptive history, in the story of salvation and history, two eras. The first room is symbolic for the whole old covenant age before Jesus. He calls this the present age. That's a way of referring to the age before Jesus came, because he'll talk about how we're at the end of the ages now. So the present age is pre-Jesus. The age to come is the new covenant era that's now dawned. It kind of overlaps with our present age, but it's, it's come into the present. So, in that old present age, the priests, they're in that first room, but they don't get to go all the way into God's presence. So, that first room represents life in that present age. You can't go into God's presence. But now there's a new age that's dawned. And that seems to be what he's saying the second room represents or pointed forward to. It represents actually going into God's presence. As Israel saw that high priest go in there once each year, they were to think, that's where we're heading one day. One day, heaven and earth will be merged again. One day, we'll get back in. One day, we'll get back into Eden. That man can go in right now once a year. We can't. But that shows us something else greater is going to come one day. So it was a preview of the coming of Jesus. And so he's saying that as long as that tabernacle and temple setup was going on, the way into God for all of us was not yet open. But the point is that now that Jesus has come, the way's open. We have access to God. We have access not just to the most holy place on earth, of an earthly tabernacle, we can draw near by faith to the very presence of God in the heavenly reality and realm. There's another point that other authors in the New Testament emphasize that the Hebrews author doesn't emphasize, and that's that the Holy Spirit has also been sent to us as His people, and we become the temple of God, and God's presence is with us. It's interesting here, though, is this author wants to show that Jesus has gone into the heavenly reality and realm, and He's made the way for us to follow Him even right now, drawing near to God. So we draw near by faith. This takes a kind of sanctified imagination to embrace because we can't see this with our physical eyes. One day we will when Jesus returns and heaven joins the new earth, but until then we have a unique new access to God that was not available before Jesus came. As we draw near by faith, God takes us into His presence. And this is why real prayer is important in drawing near to God and what a privilege it is. 
The second gift that Jesus gives is cleansed consciences. So the tabernacle couldn't do that. The priests go in every day because the sacrifices didn't really cleanse consciences permanently. And this is the point of verse 9. According to this arrangement, this earthly arrangement, gifts and sacrifices are offered that can't perfect the consciences of the worshiper, but deal only with food and drink and various washings, regulations for the body. So the tabernacle was a reminder to the people again that they needed a deeper cleansing. Not only could they not get in, they needed a deeper cleansing from sin. So day after day, month after month, year after year, we kept needing sacrifices. The idea of a clean conscience here has to do with this awareness of our real guilt before God. We sin, we're weighed down with guilt because we are guilty, and the sacrifices of animals cannot cleanse us deep enough. But all of that pointed forward to Jesus' sacrifice, which we'll see next week. He died once for all to cleanse us so we can enter God's presence with confidence. And then finally, Jesus came to bring true reformation. Notice that phrase at the end of verse 10. The old setup was imposed until the time of reformation. And the time of reformation has now come because Jesus brought it. That word for reformation refers to something being fixed, uh, something being set right again. It's about repairing something that's broken. So, Jesus came to repair the broken relationship with God. He came to bridge the gap again between heaven and earth between us and God. So here's the point of Advent. In Christ, God came near to us so we could be brought near to God. And the tabernacle was telling this story all along. So how can this help us celebrate Advent? A couple thoughts. First, let's marvel at God's plan. At Advent, when you think about Christmas, step back and put plug Advent into the bigger story and just marvel at God's infinite wisdom to plan history as He did. God's plan all along from the beginning was to have Jesus open the way up to Him. So, this is why He set up the tabernacle. He could have just had Jesus open the way right away, but He had the tabernacle set up to communicate this message and to cultivate longing and to instruct us So we understand when Jesus came. So when God made the tabernacle, He was giving Israel a glimpse of His eternal plan in Christ. So Christ does not come to fit into the old system. He is what they pointed to all along. So God planned to rescue us through Jesus, and therefore, He created the Old Testament system. So it's not as if God had a plan A, like the tabernacle, And then he's like, well, let's go to plan B. This thing's kind of, it's a tent. This isn't going to last. Let's make a temple. And this isn't really working because that can get destroyed. Let's go to plan C. I have a really good idea. Jesus can come, right? That's not how it works. Um, His plan all along was to send Jesus, and he decided to unfold a beautiful story along the way. So let's just marvel and honor him for writing history as he did. Second, don't cling to the copies. The message for the first readers was this. The realities come, so don't cling to the copies, right? Don't hold the picture if the sun is here. Don't go back to temple worship. Don't go back to thinking you need priests. Don't go back to endless sacrifices. Don't go back to Judaism. The whole point of it has come. It's Jesus. Trust Him. Love Him. Draw near to Him, the risen, living Christ, by faith. So now for us, I don't think many of us are tempted to convert to Judaism, but many are tempted to follow a religion that's very much like Old Testament Judaism. In fact, uh, various aspects of the Catholic faith have done this in some ways. They've embraced Christ in some way as Messiah, but then they've recreated a lot of the tabernacle and temple structures in order to present Christianity and experience Jesus. They've Christianized the tabernacle structures. So the gathering is viewed in some ways as entering a sacred holy space and sanctuary, and there's priests who mediate for the people. 
And the Lord's Supper is in some ways viewed like a sacrifice. All these things are recreating the symbolic world of the Old Testament, but Christianizing them. But the reality has come. Jesus is our high priest. We go directly to the Father through Him. The tabernacle is His presence in heaven that we can draw near to by faith. His sacrifice has already been given once for all. All the symbols were pointing forward to Jesus, and we have Him now. Other Christians are embracing Jesus as the fulfillment, but then they still expect a temple to be rebuilt one day in Jerusalem that will be the center of the world again. And I think, and I know well-meaning and thoughtful Christians believe that, I think that's misguided. Jesus has come. It would be very strange to rewind redemptive history and go back to centering on the forms again with a temple and sacrifices again. Jesus has come, though. Those are the shadows and copies. He's the point. So don't cling to the copies. Third, this helps us cultivate longing. At Advent, we really celebrate two Advents. So Advent means arrival. From the Old Testament perspective, they were waiting for one big arrival of God to set all things right, to make all things new, to be with His people forever. But we found out that there are two arrivals. Jesus came first to draw near to us and to make a way through His sacrifice and resurrection to make a way for us to draw near to God. He's now with us by the Spirit, and so we can draw near. But we're now waiting for His return. So we're waiting for the second advent. We're waiting for God to draw near to us in Christ again so that we can be with Him physically forever. So here we do draw near truly, literally, but not fully. But we long for the second coming of Jesus. So let Christmas, let Advent not just be a time to look backward, to remember the first Advent, but to cultivate a longing for the second. That's how it's always been done when it's done best. And then finally, let's go to God. Let's draw near to Him. That's the point of Advent. In Christ, God came for us, and He came to us so that we could be with Him. So, draw near to God on your own. Go to God in prayer at specific times to focus on Him in this Advent season. Go to Him in prayer together with a friend, with family. Do that throughout the day. The God who made you has made a way back for us to go with Him. So, what a great blessing then that we can go to Him whenever we want. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank You for this infinitely wise reality of Jesus entering and making a way into the true tabernacle. So we pray that You would help us to receive this grace, uh, not cling to copies, but fully embrace this dawning of the new age in Jesus, of the true tabernacle with your true presence and your heart that longs for us to be with you. So we confess that we too often neglect you. We confess that we too often focus on secondary things or less rather than drawing attention to you and being drawn near to you. And so we pray that this, these next few weeks together as a church family, you'd help us, that you'd cultivate a longing for the return of Jesus and that you would help us to radically draw near to you in this wondrous new way opened for us by Jesus. Pray this in his name. Amen.